When Dr. Armitage came here to uh, begin the bone marrow transplant program in the early 80s, he knew that there were some lymphomas that couldn't be cured with lower doses of chemotherapy, but if very high doses were given, uh, the disease could be eradicated. The problem was that high doses of chemotherapy also kill bone marrow. So this trick had been devised um, several years before that if bone marrow were collected from the patient and then the high doses of therapy were given that was known to kill all the rest of the bone marrow in the patient. But once the therapy was completed, the bone marrow was reinfused into the bloodstream that the marrow would grow back. So the bone marrow was, transplant was just a trick to allow us to give really, really high doses of chemotherapy and cure people who otherwise couldn't be cured. We began to have patients referred here who had been turned down at other centers and that's why they came here. So Dr. Armitage asked if there was some way that we might be able to bypass the marrow collection and collect the cells that cause the marrow to grow back from the bloodstream rather than from the marrow. And so that's how we set out to do what has evolved into a standard of therapy today. When we looked at how the previous two transplants had been done that were failures, it seemed pretty clear to us that the technique they used was incorrect. It wasn't that the cells wouldn't work, it's that how they applied them made it impossible for them to work. So we devised a different technique about how to not only collect them, but how to give them back. Then we began uh, our first transplant in 1984, and we waited to make sure that the marrow would recover. We had permission to do 10, and we would we did another and we waited to make sure that the marrow would recover. Uh, we tried to uh, publish this. We tried to present it at meetings and uh, um, most of the time we were turned down because this was against dogma and it's hard for people to accept it. We began doing these transplants not as an experiment anymore, but as a standard of care here for patients who couldn't get transplanted in any other way. We would present these uh, findings at general meetings and people still didn't believe that it was true. These centers who were doing these uh, studies had our own meeting. So we would meet every two years, and we didn't have to convince people that this really worked. We knew it worked. And those meetings went on for about five sessions, so that means 10 years. And then finally, we didn't have to do it anymore because then people believed that it was really true. And uh, now it's sort of the standard of care. What I could say is the rest is history because now this is the way most, not all, but most transplants are done. This is a program that's had national and international uh, recognition and now there's, uh, I have to say, there's lots of people doing, doing what we do and, and uh, part of that is because of advances that were done here and so we were one of the first places and we uh, went to meetings and published results and told other people uh, what we were doing and, and now uh, other people are doing this. We've recently looked at some of our records and uh, it turns out that actually the first two people that we transplanted in 1983 of course are still alive and we see them and they're doing well. I would suspect that uh, uh, these people are if not the longest survivors of stem cell transplantation in the country or the world, certainly in the top three or four or five. That's the, the, my favorite part of the job, is seeing these people uh, even 30 years later. And, and sometimes we only see them once a year, but I enjoy seeing the people grow up and go to school and go to college and get married and have children and have grandchildren and, 
And I don't think that would have been the case without this form of treatment. I would have never dreamed that we would do outpatient transplants. I would never have dreamed that uh, we've done roughly 4,500 transplants. I, I didn't know that we would be doing this 30 years later. For Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, we're a lot better than we used to be, and so fewer people need a transplant. I think it's our wish that we don't have to do transplants in the future. Uh, in general, we do transplants for people who uh, don't do well with their initial therapy, and I think as we get better with uh, our, our initial therapy and with our new drugs, uh, I'm hopeful that people won't relapse and they won't have to have transplants in the future. People are going to get cancer, people are going to get leukemia, people are going to get blood disorders and they're going to need, uh, need to be treated and the transplant is with us for a long time I think but there's all kinds of other treatments that are out there besides transplantation that are going to be beneficial to treat for, for these people. In 2008, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I was being treated um, up in Sioux City where I went to school. I had just graduated nursing school um, right when I got sick. We had heard a lot about the med center and knew it was the place to come, and we were only an hour and a half away, which made it absolutely the number one choice for us. It was amazing. Um, have nothing but good things to say about the care I received here. Just of how the care is here, I just thought someday I really want to be a part of that. I first started out as a staff nurse on the OSHU here at the Med Center, and when a lymphoma transplant coordinator position came open, I thought, why not try for it? And um, I got it and couldn't be happier. I think we have some of the leading lymphoma and leukemia doctors in the nation here, and I feel like we're leading in research every day. I think that's one of our top goals here is to just make sure that every patient and their family feel like they're being well taken care of and that they're very important and that this is the most serious time in their life. And I feel like that's where our serious medicine extraordinary care comes into play. I definitely like to let patients know that there's hope on the other side and you can have a quote unquote normal life again after cancer. So. Um, I think that's really important because when you're the patient and you're going through something like that, that's really all you're, you're striving for is to know that I can get through this and there's hope on the other side. I'm a faithful person so to me in life everything happens for a reason and I feel like I was given this horrible disease for a reason and to help others through it but I feel like I'm doing a lot of God's work by doing what I do. So I'm at my five year point right now in remission and I can honestly say I owe it all to God and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I was healthy, so I thought. Uh, hadn't been to a doctor in years, was an avid tennis player and uh, had they been experiencing a, a lump that came and went under my right arm, I just thought it was allergy related. I said I should go to the doctor. And he came over and his face was blank, white. He said, uh, I think you have a form of lymphoma. They started to toss out where to go. Uh, you can, we can send you anywhere. I said, well, I'll go anywhere. And they threw every uh, you know, facility in America, every major hospital, whether it be Seattle or Houston, or whether it be uh, Minnesota or New York, uh, whether it be uh, Boston or Baltimore, uh, at me and then uh, they said uh, or you can go to the University of Nebraska's Medical Center in Omaha and Dr. Jim Armitage. Wow. All these other places were brick and mortar and now you're talking about a human being. So where do I want to be? Do I want to be in a place that has a name attached to it that sounds human? Uh, in a place maybe like the Midwest where people treat each other with respect and concern and care? or go to one of these other places that might just make me a patient number. I want to be David. I want to be the patient that they care about, not the one that ends up in a medical journal somewhere. So the decision to come here was clear. Came here and it's uh, been a major part of my life, uh, being cured by Dr. Armitage and, and uh, Dr. Bierman. The nursing staff was uh, awesome. 
Uh, they were, uh, you know, on top of you at all hours of the day and night, 24 hours a day. Now, fortunately for me, I had uh, a caregiver from home, my wife, and uh, she was awesome. I went to sleep with her by my side and woke up and there she was uh, for an entire 100 day uh, process. It was easy to try to get involved with, uh, 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 with the concept of a new facility uh, like the Lead Transplant Center and how can I as a patient help introduce what my experiences were as a patient and my wife as a caregiver to the construction of a new facility and how that might influence the next group. Uh, that's going to follow me. They wanted uh, somebody who was from the patient side to be part of uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony, uh, that uh, grand opening. I didn't speak about uh, fundraising. I didn't speak about uh, 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 the hospital as an institution. I spoke about the community. I spoke about the people. I spoke about Omaha. I spoke about my experiences with uh, being cared about and what uh, the true meaning of caregivers uh, was all about to me. With as many people as I can, um, I'm not shy about it. Uh, I'm certainly not shy about why I came here. I'm not shy about the care I got here. Uh, we've had friends and family who we've referred to uh, UNMC who also have come here and uh, under duress at other hospitals found a uh, cure here. People want you to go to other places. Uh, you hear a lot of other hospitals around America that sound like they're better and sound like they can do, you know, everything that's expected of them. And then you come here and you witness that. You witness the fact that the, this hospital is so special. Uh, it's, I think, very unique. Um, the community at large is very unique. Uh, the new medical center that's going to be built is going to be, you know, a world class and one of a kind. It's a miracle. Um, I'm glad to tell it. And if somebody can, you know, grab hold of my story and run with it uh, and be as successful as I've been um, through, through all of that history, um, then I know why I got uh, the disease in the first place.